Welcome to the Vandy Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Lee. Our guest today, George Plaster of Nashville Sports Radio. We will review the baseball decade and also take some mailbag questions. This episode sponsored by the Well Coffee House, which is a Nashville area coffee house providing fresh roasted coffee along with its house-made pastries, breakfast and lunch offerings. There are four locations to serve you in the Nashville area. Those are Brentwood Green Hills downtown and Bellevue. You can find more information at wellcoffeehouse.org, the Well Coffee House where coffee changes lives. We thank our co-sponsor, Wellspire, Nashville's Learning and Development Center. That is located in the Gulch. Today's news presented by Sutherland and Belk, a family-owned injury law firm. If you or a loved one has been hurt in any type of accident, call Taylor or Russell at 615-846-6200. See if they can help, and they will tell you what your rights are as well. Vanderbilt will travel to Arizona to play Loyola of Chicago. Tip-off is 530 Central on CBS Sports Network. That game is on Wednesday evening. The guest line presented by Bowling Branch, started by Vanderbilt graduates Scott and Missy Tannen. I've slept on Bowling Branch sheets for years. They're phenomenal. Had no idea what I was missing till I got them. They are fair trade certified, meaning they are made under safe conditions by men and women treated and paid fairly. Try them free for a month. You can return them, but you won't want to. Once you get the sheets, try the mattress, which was voted best mattress of 2018. Go to bowlandbranch.com. That is spelled B-O-L-L. Enter the promo code Vandy and get $50 off your first set of sheets. George Plaster, our guest now. George, I appreciate you joining us today. Hope your holiday season is going well. Absolutely, and it is, and want to wish everybody uh, a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year while I've got the chance to. Yeah, and I saw some spitting snow outside, so let's hope we get some of that, although I'm thinking we won't. But anyway. Do not hold your breath. <laughs> well, it's it's always a treat to talk to you, whether there is snow involved or not. And I thought we would spend today doing sort of a decade review show and then going into the mailbag to end it. And let's start with the one that's easiest to talk. It's baseball. And I remember 2010, the start of the decade. And of course, 2007 is three years in the rearview mirror. At that point in time, I think, there was a nervousness around the program. and Would it ever get to where Tim Corbin thought it would and where a lot of us thought it would go after Vanderbilt was number one the whole season of 2007? And of course, we know what happened that year and the following years. And so 2010 was an interesting year because Vanderbilt gets back to a super regional. And I remember driving to Tallahassee, which is probably one of the five hottest spans of time I've ever spent in my life. It was unbelievable down there in May. I went to it. It was, it, I mean, I, yeah, I cannot describe how hot it was. It was hot in the shade. Uh, fortunately, I was in the press box, but when I was not, it was unbearable. But anyway, I remember going down there and I remember going to dinner with some people that were FSU fans and the attitude was, it's funny that in hindsight, you could just tell they knew they were going to roll Vandy, or that's what they thought. Vanderbilt made it very interesting. And darn near got out of Tallahassee with an appearance in the College World Series, but it didn't happen that way. And I remember driving back. I had a buddy of mine who was a booster. He and I rode down there together. I remember just looking at him after it was over, and he just looked defeated, and he said, I'm just not sure that they're ever going to get there. And I, I was thinking in my head, that's not the feeling that I have at all because that team got really close. You knew that it brought back a ton for the next year. And, boy, was that prophetic or what? Because from 2011 on, uh, that's been, I guess, the best program in the country, George. What Tim Cor- Corbin has done is absolutely amazing. And let's face it, this is a school that athletically – if you're a diehard fan, you're going to have to deal with a lot of thin to ever get to the thick. Uh, it's just the way it's been. And so oftentimes there's a little bit of a, oh, no, here we go again, kind of an attitude. But you could just tell with him the, the way he was stockpiling pitching 
the way virtually no other programs that we were watching could do, that at some point they were going to go knock that door down. You know, I remember, um, I guess it was 2007 when Price gave up the long ball against Michigan on that Monday night. Uh, that there were a lot of little building blocks that went into all of this. But once they got there, it's like they sunk their teeth in and they've, they've never let go. It's amazing what he's done. I'm looking back to 2010. I grabbed the media guide as you were talking. And, okay, th- that was the year that they beat Louisville. Actually, that was the year that, if you remember this, let's see, they beat Illinois State in the opener, lost to Louisville, and then they won that Sunday first game against Illinois State, beat Louisville in the Richie Goodnow game, got to Monday night, and I believe that was the walk-off bunt game where, oh, good grief, was it Connor Harrell scored the winning run? I can't remember now, but I remember the play. They they laid a, a sacrifice down third. Uh, the runner got home, and, and then they went into Tallahassee where they lost, I've forgotten this, they lost two one-run games. And that was a little bit of a, a pinball machine of a, of a park, too. But you go from there, 2011, they make the College World Series with – Frankly, what was one of his better teams, that was the year I thought they really got screwed in the seeding. Um, they were 22-8. and eight. If you looked at run differential, they tied for the conference championship with South Carolina and Florida. But run differential, they were way out in front of those teams. They got the sixth seed in Omaha, which got them in the Florida bracket. That was the one team they couldn't handle that year. Boy, you go back and look through the decades, and, of course, 2014, they got one. 2019, they got one. We'll talk about those later. But, boy, you, you look at that. If the seeding in 2011, it, I think, had been more fair to them. Uh, maybe they get one that year. And, of course, you know, the Donnie Everett thing just sidetracked that program, I think, for for three years. But you look back at what they did, um, which was phenomenal enough on its own. But, boy, a break or two here or there, and there could have been another title or two in there, George. You know, uh, you're bringing back some amazing memories. In 2011, while they were in uh, while they were in Omaha, I was on a Major League Baseball ballpark tour with uh, a buddy of mine, and we had gone I'm trying to think. We had gone Pittsburgh, Fenway, the new Mets Stadium, City Field, the new Yankee Stadium. Baltimore, I'm missing one somewhere, but we were at Mickey Mantle's restaurant watching Vandy lose to Florida, and you know, Florida, Florida's a tough bunch, and they always have been, um, but I remember thinking at the time, they are eventually going to knock this door down. They did it a couple of years later. Uh, I've been to Omaha one time. I went in 2015 when they lost to Virginia in the uh, third and deciding game. I'll say this. The whole Omaha experience is even better than I thought it would be. Will Perdue and Steve Reese and I went in 15 and just absolutely had a blast. I mean, you talk about Ferris Bueller's week off. Um you know, we went and saw the Kansas City Royals and the Red Sox play. We played golf on some beautiful course on the Platte River. There's some great memories of all of that. So thanks to Tim Corbin for making all that happen. Yeah, I have some memories from that trip, too. Speaking of the Platte River, I think that thing's, what, like two feet deep? <laughs> yeah, and there's some golf balls. Uh, in that river, courtesy of me. <laughs> right, right. Uh, yeah, and and speaking of the, the what could have been, maybe the biggest what could have been of that decade was that 2013 team, which just steamrolled everything, 26-3 and three in the league. That'll never be broken. And it just ran out of gas against Louisville. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I remember about that weekend – uh, the former Vandy pitcher Jensen Lewis had come to town for plaster broadcast camp. And um, he had just been released by the Iowa Cubs. And I had always told him I thought he had great broadcast ability. 
So during that weekend, we set up uh, the plaster broadcast camp where uh, we got Jensen a talk show tape, went over to Fox 17 and taped a segment as though it was part of a Sunday night show that I had uh, that I used to do. And then we did, I don't know, like five innings of play by play in color out at the uh, Greer Stadium. And I had told Jensen, you know, now you've got your tapes, send them out to the majors, send them out to all the clubs. This is probably going to take you about a year. And three weeks later, the Cleveland Indians hired him as their pre and post game host. Uh, and it's a job he still has. And uh, I just remember that weekend, you know, he came into town. We went to both games and Louisville's pitching just dominated uh, what was supposed to be a best out of three, but turned into a, a two gamer. And that, that was pretty frustrating. Yeah. Jensen was one of my favorite people I dealt with in my time covering the program. But of course that was, that was another one of those moments where I think a lot of people were thinking, Hey, are they ever going to get over the hump and win over one of these things? And of course, next year out of the blue, they did. Well, I think it goes, and, and maybe this is too much the Braves fan in me. Winning a championship is hard. Uh, getting there, not easy, but being able to be the one out of, in this case, eight that get to Omaha, those other seven teams are pretty damn good too. And there's a reason they're all there. And, you know, sometimes you need a little bit of luck to go on your side. Um, I think we all remember, well, I'm trying to remember the year they won it. They get a pinch hit three run homer in the bottom of the ninth inning to beat Cal State Fullerton that sort of sets them on the path to winning that NCAA tournament. I, I just keep going back to a saying that unfortunately I have to use too often with the Braves. Winning a championship is hard. Yeah, and I don't think people really realize how much a sports is breaks. I remember 2014, they were playing against the Kirby kid at Virginia who was just phenomenal that year. And nobody had really hit him much. And he just really shut them down for the first two or three innings. And I was just thinking, boy, this is going to be a long day. They get that nine-run inning and break that game open. Uh, This would have been game one. I think they got all their runs in that inning, uh, if I'm I'm correct. But in any case, and and they didn't really hit a lot of balls hard. They just found holes. Tyler Campbell, I think, hits a, a triple down the line that accounted for two or three runs. That's one of them that stands out. But really, that was the year, you know, the, the Norwood home run uh, was such a, a weird deal. Uh, there weren't many balls hit out of the park all year. Um, it, it was just one of those things that I don't believe in team of destiny because if I ever thought there was a team of destiny, it was 07. But you contrast that with 2015. 2014, it seems like they got the breaks in Omaha. 2015, you know, a ball hits a bag going down first at Xander Wheel, uh, Xander Wheel can't field, that takes a normal hop. Uh, you know, that they may win that one too. It's just really weird to go back and think about how really just the turn of events in 2014 and 2015 at the very end were very different and ended up in very different outcomes. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there's – and you see – this a lot in the NCAA tournament, basketball tournament, where a, a, a lot of times teams that go on to win it all have one game that, you know, they have to get over a hump. Uh, I can remember a Georgetown team that beat a John Concack SMU team 37 to 36, and that was the one game they had to survive, you know, for Hoya Paranoia to, to take it all the way. Um, you know, you look at that Jim Valvano 30 for 30 special and you see a game against Pepperdine where they're down 10 with a minute left in regulation. Oftentimes, you've got to have some luck go your way in sports. It's one of the things that I guess is so miraculous about what the Patriots have done, uh, what Nick Saban has done at Alabama. 
winning a championship is hard. And, uh, you know, I keep going back to that phrase because it is. Um, and, and the teams that keep getting over the hump, at, at times you're just amazed uh, that they're able to continue doing it. Of course, you fast forward to 2016. That was the sort of the reset year where they had all young players, and you know they're playing well. They they win 47 games heading into the postseason, which is a lot. They go 18 and 12 in the league, which is a really good accomplishment. I mean, by that point, people just took that for granted, but that was a good record. And then the Donnie Everett thing happens, and it just seemed like the – I'm not going to say the wheels came off for the next three years, but they certainly did that super regional uh, for, for reasons everybody can understand. That bunch was exhausted. It was a miracle um, <laughs> that it wasn't worse in some ways. Um, but 2017, 2018, they, they kind of went back to the level where they had been before they started getting to Omaha – uh, but for reasons that are completely understandable, um, I just wonder, boy, and when you're talking about loss of human life, that's a, a different thing entirely. That supersedes everything. But from the baseball end, you can't help but wonder how that might have gone differently if Donnie Everett's around. And I know that I talked to Tim a couple years later. He said, I felt really good about where we were in 2016 heading into that postseason and good about our chances in the regional. Of course, we, we know what happened next. But that's got to be one of the biggest what-ifs in the history of Vanderbilt sports is um, if, if that all goes differently. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that's one of the most awful stories, sad story. Um, I, I can't imagine what it was like to try to play that weekend uh, with what had gone on. You're right. They were headed towards something that was, uh, you know, by anybody's standards, amazing. Um, we're never going to know. I sense that that almost broke Tim Corbin. And I say that 100% non judgmentally uh, because I think it would have broken a lot of people, uh, especially a guy like Tim, who I think loves and cares about his players genuinely. I think that that hurt him beyond measure. Well, I I can't possibly put myself in his shoes, but anytime there's loss of human life, it's sad. Um, You know, even, you know, when you, when you hear about somebody who, who passes away, they're in their eighties or their nineties and they've had a great life. It's really easy to say that to the people around them. Well, they had a good life, but here was a, a young man who was just in, you know, beginning the prime of his life, 18, 19 uh, years old. And that's a tragedy. And the way all of that happened is a tragedy. Um, I don't pretend to know the family very well. I knew the dad a little bit. Um, The dad, I would see oftentimes he was uh, uh, worked for the uh, U.S. Postal Office. And I would see him uh, up at the Harding Road branch from time to time. And you know, your heart just goes out to them because, you know, their lives are never the same after that. No, and I don't know how they did what they did because, and I've never been there, uh, but if that had been my son, I mean, it, it just devastating beyond words. And you understand it differently when you're a father. I mean, it's hard enough as it is, but once you're a dad and you see it through that lens, it is it is incredibly difficult to compre- difficult to comprehend how people get through it. But I thought one of the coolest things about 2019 was it was sort of, redemption is not the right word, but at least a happier ending for a group of kids and coaches who went through all that. And I thought one of the coolest things, not only was seeing the Everett's getting to be a part of it, but I remember seeing during one of the key moments, they flashed the camera over to Donnie Everett and he's celebrating a big moment, that was really neat to be able to see them be able to enjoy that after all that they had gone through. Absolutely, and and kudos to Tim for the way he treated their family. Uh, He made it clear to them that while Donnie may have been gone, that they continued to be part of his Vanderbilt baseball family, and that's 
to me, as great a baseball coach as he is, that's the part of him as a human being that I think all of us admire so much. And that was a very cool moment. Um, you know, I, I think back, I, we lost a classmate of ours when I was at BGA. And 40 some odd years later, you know, I, I can still remember that day like it was yesterday. And, you know, those kids, as they, uh, you know, went through their college career, that's that's a moment in time they're never going to forget. Uh, you know, the time time makes it a little better, but you don't ever forget. Yeah, and I don't think he ever will. But I sensed in Tim, you know, 2007 really was hard on him. And, and you know him like I do. That was hard on him because he felt like he did not get his kids where he thought they deserved to be. And he took it personally. Uh, 2011, I think, started to heal that a little bit. 2014, when you were around him, uh, he was a different guy, I thought. I, I think that that really relieved a lot of pressure on him. I think 2016, in its own way, uh, sort of, he was feeling the burden of all that again, which I don't know how you couldn't. I think 2019 was sort of their reset button again to where they were able to finally heal and get beyond a lot of that. And you look back at things, and people have had this discussion on our boards, George, which was the greater accomplishment, 2014 or 2019? And it's easy to say the first, but I think the second, given what they had been through and given just how dominant they were. I mean, the 2014 team, I think, was sixth in the league and got hot at the end and caught the breaks. What Mm -hmm. they did last year, I think, all things considered, has got to be one of the greatest team accomplishments in college sports in my lifetime. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to disagree with that. Um, I keep going back to the whole winning a championship is hard. Uh, it's hard no matter what the circumstances. And they had the mental baggage of what had happened three years ago as a little bit of a backdrop. And uh, good for them that they were able to knock that down. And and good for Tim Corbin uh, for the way he treated Donnie's mom and dad and, and family and, you know, just made it very clear, you know, you will always be a part of this family. And while that never takes away the sting of what happened, it had to at least provide for a moment where they could smile, um, you know, and, and enjoy. Anything else about the baseball decade that stands out to you? Of course, uh, Commodores had a number one pick in there with Dansby Swanson. Um, just the number one picks continue their setup for that again. There's so much to discuss there. I, I think one of the remarkable things was a lot of teams are great for short periods of time. I think it's almost harder to be good for a long stretch. They got to the tournament every year. They've now been to the tournament every year since 06, which is now the second longest streak in college baseball behind only Florida State, which darn near missed it last year. I think in the championships, almost how good they have been for how long is sort of gone underrated, George. Yeah, I mean, look, when he's gone, you know, whoever ends up replacing him, and I hope it's no time soon, they're, they're going to feel the burden uh, of what he has accomplished. Because as you just laid it out, out there, this, this is a long time one of greatness that we may never see again. Um, it's, it's just, you know, it, it's mind boggling. The only other person that had really given you any inkling that this could ever be done here was Larry Schmidt. And in the mid seventies, he had a series of teams that won sec titles, got to regionals. And then he decided to get into the minor league baseball business and create what is now the Nashville sounds. I'd always thought baseball had the best shot of something like this, but to this level, whoa, uh, I never saw that coming. Yeah, and we were going to try to review 
the decade in all three sports. I think in the interest of time, plus the fact that we've got the mailbag, we're just going to do baseball today. But the other thing that you think about is just the players that have gone through there. I mean, off the top of my head, you could put together this all-star team, okay? You could go Kirk Casale at catcher, Aaron Westlake at first, Tony Kemp at second, Dansby Swanson at third, Austin Martin, excuse me, Austin Martin at third, and Swanson at short. In the outfield, you could go, oh man, Blade, um, you could put Steven Scott out there, Brian Reynolds certainly belongs out there, and I feel like I'm missing a person or two. It is really incredible. Oh, and, and then you go, you go to the pitching. Uh, boy, you could go any number of ways. There you go, Carson Fulmer. You could go Walker Bueller. You could throw Kumar Rocker in there. Kyle Wright. It, it is just incredible if you start doing like even an all-decade twenty-five man roster. You're leaving off some really good players in there. Oh yeah, uh, but with the last thing you go to pitching is the most important, um, and, and this is where. This is where I think he's gotten an edge over a lot of people is his ability to just keep, um, you know, producing pitching staffs that are major league caliber kind of stuff. I, I just shake my head. I'm just amazed at what he's done. Well, and just to prove my point about how many players they've had, here are guys that in the off the top of my head team, I did not mention Tyler Beattie. Sonny Gray, Jaron Kendall, um, Patrick Raby. I mean, you, those guys all made Team USA, and they weren't even on my my first blush All Star team. It, it's really remarkable what he's done. Yeah, and and I'll say this: um, Tyler Beatty is one I'm really interested um, to see where this goes because he got a, a good stint with the Giants a year ago and I got to watch him got to watch him and Mike Yastrzemski a lot I have the baseball the extra innings package and um and I watch a lot of baseball and both of them really proved that they belonged at that level and you know I think it's a lot like when you go to a good school and then you go to you know you go to a a college and you say well I was prepared I've always believed that BGA prepared me you know, to try to get by the skin of my teeth at Vandy. Well, I think Vandy baseball got guys like Tyler Beatty and Mike Yastrzemski ready for their journey. And when they hit the big time, they were ready for it. You know, you could put together next year probably a pitching staff, a serviceable big league staff, just among Vanderbilt alums who are in the majors right now, or maybe call a couple up, a Kyle Wright or someone from AAA, I'm convinced you could field a very competitive uh, 12-, 13-man pitching staff just from Vanderbilt guys right now. Yeah, and I'd like to swipe a couple of them um, for a certain team out there that may have a hold or two. Yeah, well, I mean, off the top of the head, you could go Bueller is your one, Price is your two, Sonny Gray is your three. Um, I know I'm leaving some guys out, but it's crazy. Yeah. So it is, it's amazing. Let's go to the mailbag, which is sponsored by Vanderbilt fan, Josh Minton, an independent insurance agent operating out of Brentwood. If you're looking for a one-stop shop to take care of your insurance needs, Josh has you covered. Call him today at 615-933-1979. Email him at josh at hqinsurance.com. Follow him on Twitter at Joshua Minton HQ or at Facebook.com forward slash JD Minton HQ. He is my insurance agent. Give him a try. Tell him you heard about it here. We're going to switch to hoops for a minute. Door fan wants to know over under for SEC wins in men's hoops is four, which he said as he said himself. Do you have a take about the over and under and why? Uh, I'll go under. I think they are what we thought they are. Uh, they're a team that lacks Division One talent. Uh, I went to the game Saturday against Liberty, and it was pretty graphic. Uh, first of all, Richie McKay has done a tremendous job at Liberty. And down the stretch, it was either Neesmith or 
Saban Lee who was going to have to win that game for them. And it just comes down to two or three possessions. And if you hit the shot, you know, you might end up being a winner. And if you don't, which is what happened Saturday night, then you're not going to win. How many games they even get into a position to win in the last three or four minutes is debatable. And then it comes down to probably Neesmith uh, or Saban Lee hitting a shot. And the problem is they don't have enough Division I talent. Um, they just don't. And, um, you know, I think we've all suspected that. They play hard. There's nothing about their effort uh, to question. Uh, early on, there doesn't seem to be a lot about Jerry Stackhouse coaching-wise to question. I think this is just a real simple deal. They don't have enough Division I talent. No, and I was looking at their roster yesterday and the distribution of players and when they graduate. They're going to have a very veteran team the next two or three years, especially if Aaron Neesmith stays. It'll be interesting to see how they develop. Well, they're going to have to overhaul this roster at some point. They've got too many people on that roster that just are not Division I level players. And, you know, you can point all the fingers you want wherever you want to point them, but that's just, it's just, I mean, it's become pretty obvious that that's the case. Is this a fair way to sum it up? Um, they've got Neesmith, who's a superstar. They've got Lee, who's a star. Uh, I don't know what Scottie Pippen is just yet. I need to see him play against better teams. Offensively, I like his game. Defensively, I don't. So kind of throw him in the X factor. We're not sure what they have with him there yet. And the rest of the roster, and I think Dylan DeSue can be the exception to this because I think he's a talented kid. He's just a freshman. But right now, for the most part, They've got a lot of eighth, ninth, tenth men on most rosters kind of players. I don't think I need to add anything. I think you you just nailed it in one paragraph where I was babbling around and and searching for the right answers. I, I would say Nee Smith one, Saban Lee two, Pippen three. Uh, you brought up the, uh, the the young freshman as the fourth, and the rest of it. Um, it's just a lack of Division One talent. Mr. Vandy says, what player on the basketball team needs to step up the most to help them be as successful as they can be? Oh, I'll throw that one back at you. I want to hear your answer to it. I'm going to go to Sue. Yeah, I, I like I, that kid. You know what? Yeah, I, I think you're right. Uh, I think he's, He's the one that I see that I say, hmm, this might be fairly interesting. Yeah, that's uh, I don't get I don't get that take. feeling with a lot of them. Yeah, that that's that's a good way to put it, George. I because I think that that question implies like who's got upside that that yeah. we could see substantially beyond where he is, and he's really outside of those three guards. The rest of them are are either. To advance, well, I mean, Edge K. Obina would be the other guy. I'm, and a lot of people think he's got a lot of potential. Uh, we, we will wait and see. The, the big man thing, <laughs> the roadside is littered with big men who have a lot of potential who never realized it. They're not going to get a lot out of their big men. Oh, no, not this year. Uh, you know, maybe maybe he does the Will Purdue, the light comes on for next year, but, but I don't see it right now. Uh, let's see. Dan B. Nash says, does George C. Dansby Swanson taking a step forward offensively this year for the Braves? Do you think Kyle Wright could become a starter this year for the Braves? It seems he was poised to start the season but lacked the consistency to stay up. Uh, and then he asks if they might consider moving Kyle Wright in a trade for a bat if they don't re-sign Donaldson. That's a lot right there. So basically... To break it down, he wants to know what you think of Kyle Wright and Dansby Swanson and where those careers are heading. Yeah. First of all, I think Dansby started to do it a year ago, and an injury that kept him out for a while kind of impeded the progress. Um, the thing I liked from day one was he was taking the ball to right and right center and driving it with authority. 
nothing about his defense needs to be questioned at all. That side of the the product is is terrific. Uh, offensively, uh, I felt like he was getting there a year ago before the injury. Uh, I hear all this Francisco Lindor trade stuff. I don't buy any of it. They are not going to trade for Lindor. Now that they have not gotten Madison Baumgartner and he's ended up signing in Arizona, I think this allows the young guys, Kyle Wright, uh, Sean Newcomb, um, Bryce Wilson, it gives them the shot in spring training to maybe win the fifth starting job. Uh, Whether any of them do or not uh, remains to be seen. Could Kyle Wright get packaged uh, in some sort of a deal, perhaps? Uh, At this moment, I don't believe they're going to re-sign Josh Donaldson. I don't understand why they're so worried about the fourth year. If that's what it takes to knock the door down to win a world title, you know, this is simple. This is simply where Liberty Media uh, hinders their chances. And if they let Josh Donaldson go simply because they wouldn't take the gamble on a fourth year, shame on Liberty Media. The contract thing is getting really interesting because teams have overpaid for years now. When you get the mega stars like the Bryce Harper, you know those are going to end up being bad contracts like the ones that Albert Pujols got signed to uh, in those last few years. So that seems like a tax that teams have always been willing to pay. The interesting thing to me right now, George, is how many teams are trying to shed some of those contracts. And some of these are deeper market Teams. I mean, you see the Red Sox. There's talk about trying to shed some salary with David Price. You've seen it with the Cubs. Chris Bryant's name has been bandied around. Then again, you have the Yankees that signed Garrett Cole to a King's ransom. Uh, And, of course, what Washington did with Strasburg, but it also could not afford Rendon after it did that. It seems to me like some of the organizations in Major League Baseball are starting to take those – latter years of that contract a little bit more seriously. Yeah, and it involves the payment of the luxury tax. I mean, I laugh right now when I hear the Red Sox uh, in this attempt to move David Price, and the part of it that's laughable, what they're trying to do is free up enough money to sign Mookie Betts. Well, I don't believe anybody is going to pick up Price's hefty price tag. And the Red Sox are going to have to throw in a huge chunk of the money to make that trade work, which defeats the purpose of why they think they're going to do it. So here, here's my Christmas prediction. David Price isn't going anywhere uh, just because of what I've just brought up. Now, what will be funny is when I get to the office later today and I see that David Price gets traded, and then you can play this back and go, oh, how smart are you? Well, I don't know, and I've seen people say this on Twitter, that Price is that bad of a financial deal given what pitchers are signing for right now, what Cole signed for. I mean, in other words, Price at $217 million, um, maybe does. I know he's not Garrett Cole, but given the extra money you have to pay for Cole, people have made the point that it's not the worst deal around. No, um, there's there there's a couple of different books on price right now. There there's one book that says that he's lost two, three, four miles an hour on his fastball. I can remember a Sunday night um, that I saw him at Yankee Stadium get beat around pretty good about a year and a half ago, and that was when I said, okay, he he really has lost lost something. But then I've watched him a couple. I'm not sure. You know, I, he, he's one of those that, that I would want to see the radar gun early in the year to kind of see where he is. Uh, but I, I don't believe for a minute that the Red Sox are able to make the trade the way they want to make it. Yeah, there's been a lot of talk about them having to throw in a prospect or another good player to get another team to take the salary, which is probably going to be what they'll have to do. But yeah, it, it's it's a lot like when the Braves tried to get rid of B.J. Upton. They yeah. had a $75 million contract, and so the Padres said, yeah, we'll take him, 
now who are you going to give us? And the answer was Craig Kimbrell. Uh, oops. <laughs> yeah, oops indeed. Seymour83 says, what trades and free agent moves besides Josh Donaldson would you like to see the Braves make? I think if they don't re-sign Josh Donaldson, that they're going to make a real run at Marcel Ozuna uh, for a couple of reasons. They could use an outfielder, and they could use one with real pop. Um, I- I'll just go on record. Uh, I'm fine if Austin Riley ends up being their third baseman. Um uh, he suffered from what virtually every player suffers from. And that is the book got out on him after a hot streak and major league pitchers aren't stupid. They read that book and they made him look silly toward the end of the season. Well, now it's time for Austin Riley to make the adjustment to their adjustment. He's a smart kid. I have a lot of confidence that he will do that. And if Donaldson doesn't re-sign, if they'll go out and get that power bat like Ozuna, I'm fine with Austin Riley. Uh, I've got a lot more confidence in him than some people do. Well, they also have Johan Camargo, and now Culberson is sort of backup plans. Uh, They need to platoon, or uh, in fact, I'm not even sure what the platoon splits would be there, but they do have some... Some, I guess, some cushion on the bench, you might say, if that's what they do. Sure they do. So. And, and Camargo, Camargo can turn on a fastball with anybody. And Culberson, there's a reason he had the name Clutch Charlie. Um, I, I was really down in the dumps when they released him. I thought it was a stupid move. And I'm glad that somebody came to their senses a week later. And maybe it was a, a penny-pinching Liberty Media deal where they got him for about 800000 cheaper. Um, but anyway, I'm glad I'm glad they've got Culberson back. Dorfan says, I know it's your dream job to be on the radio play-by-play for the Braves. If that's not it, what would it be? Uh, also, what would you be doing if you never got into broadcasting? He gives you three choices, clergy, Green Hills, Y, pickup legend, or C, the third choice is you fill in the blank. Uh, I would have been an attorney, Um, and and here's why I say that. When when I got sued in 2003, I I didn't know a lot about the legal world. Um, But first of all, my case was really a fascinating case. There were a lot of broadcasters uh, in the Southeast that that reached out to me wanting to know what it was about, Um, because it was not just a simple non-compete kind of deal there there was a little more to it than that and as as the case drug on for about a year and a half I found myself getting more and more into the case Um, I started out not knowing anything Uh, I ended it knowing a lot and I think I'd have been a really good attorney because I've got you know some speaking skills um, you know, I, I'd like to think I can think on my feet, uh, but I can't see how in the world I'd get through law school. I haven't quite reconciled that part of it. Um, you know, being being Bandy's announcer was a dream job. Uh, it was something I grew up wanting. The unfortunate part of it was at the time that it happened, uh, it was a really a low ebb for Vandy sports. Rod Dalhauer had just become the football coach. They weren't very good. Jan had, uh, had been the basketball coach. Fogler had left. It was not a great time for Vandy athletics. And the other thing was being a talk show host and, and being a play by play and answer. You know, it's hard to go on the air and be Mr. Positive when your team is two and nine and has the worst offense in Division One football. And so it, it was a different kind of deal where I, I felt like no matter what I did or said, that somebody wasn't going to be happy. Either I wasn't going to do the talk show job the way it deserved to get done, or people were not going to be happy with the things I ended up saying about Vandy. <laughs> yeah, that, that that's a familiar feeling. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking as you go through that, I know we need to, to go here in a second. 
other than baseball, and forget the, the you got the facility stuff on the the landscape. Probably you've got the explosion of Nashville, uh, the explosion of Vanderbilt, and the rise up the national rankings academically. So the context is different. But just if you knew nothing about all that and just looked at the on field product in basketball and football, it feels so similarly to the way it did this time 20 years ago. I guess the exception would be the fact that you've got James Franklin in the not too distant rearview mirror that showed that there is hope that they can win some games, which in a way I think just frustrated everybody a little bit more. But it seems a whole lot like it did 20 years ago in those other two sports. Yeah, and and in football in particular, uh, two of the three years that I did Vandy, we were the nation's worst offense. And we couldn't walk and chew gum offensively. And when I looked at this team this year, um, you know, in frustration, I would make the comment, they can't do the simplest of things. Um, and unfortunately, the longer I would watch, you know, there would be a part of me going, I know how Joe Fisher feels because, you know, you just sit there and you, you say, well, Bandy's 80 yards away and, you know, this is the drive that hopefully will turn it around when in your heart you're saying they're never going to drive. They're never going to get this done. Um, and, and that's discouraging. When your offense is that bad, boy, it magnifies everything else that you don't do well. If your defense caves, then it looks bad. But you keep going three and out, and it just exposes every weakness you have. George, I appreciate your time today. I will be on your show this afternoon which I look forward to as always and tell people out there where they can catch you on the dial, on the app, those sorts of things, anything else you would like to promote before we end the episode. Um, Yeah, you'll be on this afternoon around two 20 on WNSR five sixty on the AM dial and 95, nine on FM. And to the shock of all, I'm now on Twitter. And if you don't believe it, just check in to George plaster TN. Thanks, George. Chris, enjoyed it as always. Merry Christmas to you and your family. Merry Christmas to you. He is George Plaster. I am Chris Lee, the host of the Vandy Sports Podcast. We appreciate you listening. We'll have more episodes coming your way later this week.